Hi everyone, my name is Brian and I work for this little tiny startup that you might have heard of. It's called Microsoft. <laughs> uh, I'm a cloud developer advocate, which I'm still trying to figure out what that means. It's just kind of three random words shoved together. Uh, but I get to work on Azure, which is pretty cool. It's the cloud that Microsoft has, in case you didn't know that Microsoft had a cloud, it does. Um, I do a little thing called Front End Happy Hour. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It's a podcast where literally all we do is get drunk and talk about JavaScript. It's like my two favorite things. Uh, it's pretty fun. I also do a thing called Front End Masters. That's what some people have recognized me from. Uh, it's a pretty cool uh, tutorial platform for learning stuff. Uh, previous to Microsoft, I also worked at Microsoft, aka LinkedIn. I uh, was there for a while. I also worked at this company. Some of you may have heard of it, Netflix, um, as well as Reddit. How many, of you, how many of you in here use Reddit? Okay, and the rest of you are probably lying, so yeah. Huh. Uh, yeah, I, used to, I worked at Reddit for a while, which was exactly as crazy as you think it was. Uh, you sono Juventino. Uh, I, I don't know how I feel that people feel about that. Am I going to get run out of town if I say that? <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, yes, well, I'll, that's, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, I just moved to Seattle like a couple weeks ago, um, but I'm originally from Utah. Jazz just lost in the playoffs, so. Uh, I, I actually used to live in Bergamo, uh, which is not very far from here, right? Uh, I was a student in Bergamo for a couple, well, for about a year. Also, Torino, which is why I like Juve, follows. Uh, Okay, and this is my dog, which I feel like is important to show people. Okay. <laughs> so, how many of you in here are primarily front-end developers, like more like client code, sort of? Okay, how many of you are more back-end type developers? I see some people shaking their heads like, okay. How many of you just like write code? Oh, that's, 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 pro <laughs> that's probably what I do. Okay. Uh, so some internet stranger tweeted this. I guess about eight months ago, seven months ago, and it bothers me a lot. Uh, it's kind, it's kind of a kind of an asshole thing to say, in my opinion. I, but I do agree with the fundamental premise of it, so I have a lot of feelings. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, I only ask that frameworks put warnings on their products when they can't be accessible. E.g., the site is best viewed with a high net worth. Like I. Yes, but screw you at the same time, right? Like I just kind of have this feeling about it. So. Uh, we're all trying our best, right? Like, no one's sitting there is like, I'm going to deliberately and try and make my website not accessible to, you know, 2G networks and, you know, low power phones and low power laptops. No one's there sitting there plotting. It's like, I'm going to screw the developing world, right? That doesn't follow. Like, we're just trying to ship code, right? Like, I'm just trying to, like, fix my feature and just get it out the door. Like, I, and I'm trying to meet my deadlines. I'm not trying to screw anyone over here, right? Which is why that bothers me so much, is no one's, no one's doing that. We're all just trying to survive, right? That's what I feel like sometimes. Most companies, they're f you're your first imperative, both as an engineer, is you need to uh, survive, like you need to not get fired, and your company needs to survive a <laughs> so that they can pay you, right? So. Not every application has to work on 2G on a low-power phone. I, and this comes down to knowing your audience, right? If you're selling high-end uh, helicopter rentals in New York City, yeah, you, you probably don't have to work on 2G networks, right? Because there's 4G throughout all of India, right? Or blah, not India, New York. <laughs> There's 4G everywhere. Like there's no, there's no sense in you spending a bunch of time optimizing for low power phones and low uh, power networks because that's not what your application is, right? Whereas if you're trying to, like a friend of mine works on an application that sells like um, like farming equipment to farmers in like rural Montana, which is 
uh, part of the U.S. that doesn't have as much, you know, cellular infrastructure. So f for him, it makes a ton of sense that they have to spend a bunch of time making sure stuff works on really crappy Android phones that work on really slow networks and stuff like that. So it comes down to knowing your audience. Like if you're not looking at your Google Analytics or whatever you're using for analytics uh, to determine what your browser support range should be and what your, you know, those sorts of like things that you should be supporting, um, then you're, you're doing it wrong. For sure. So, not everything has to work on a low power phone on 2G. That being said, we're mostly going to be talking about low power phones in 2G today. So, uh, the idea here being like these techniques will just make your application better no matter what, right? There's a strong correlation, for example, with e commerce that if your page loads faster, people buy more shit, right? So, um, these are techniques you should think about applying. Um, and I'm just going to go through a bunch of things that you can do with your build um, to make your website go faster. And then you can pick and choose what's possible for you and your application, what you can get done in one cycle, and what's not possible. Some of these things are really easy to do. Some of them are really hard to do. And I think I start off with literally the hardest one. Oh, no. This first. Uh, so I, I just wanted to get some numbers out there for you to kind of understand where we're coming from. So 2G. When, I, when I'm saying 2G today, I mean about 14 kilobits. Now, 2G can get as fast as about 50, I think, like 50 kilobits per second, and that's like top speed uh, for like an average user, right? Technically, the network can support a lot more than that, but it just doesn't. So just assume somewhere between 14 and 50, okay? 3G CDMA. CDMA is one of the technologies we use in the US. I don't think it's really that f well used in Europe, but... Um, it's about the same. So uh, when I'm talking about 3G, we're talking about 144 kilobits, give or take maybe 20. 4G LTE is uh, 100,000 kilobits per second. And then gigabit fiber, like something that you would run into your house, has a million kilobits per second. So just to give you like a, a relative scale there. So how many of you remember using one of these? Right? I remember going home from school and like putting it on and then trying to download a game that was like 70 kilo, uh, kilobytes or something like that and leaving it on overnight to download, right? Now my dad was furious because it definitely like jacked up our internet bill a ton because we, you know, that's what we were metered on. We were metered on uh, megabytes. So I want you to think about this a second. This is 56 kilobits per second. And this one was like one of the really high end ones at the time, right? <coughs> now imagine, like take yourself back to that time when you were browsing the internet using this thing, right? Like doing stuff like leaving your computer on overnight to download stuff. 2G is slower than this, <laughs> right? Now it actually gets even worse because the internet back then was designed to be used by something like this, right? So all the websites back then were not very complicated, right? They had to be because one, we didn't really have the technology for it, and two, like, if you had to, if your user had to wait overnight for your website to load, yeah, they're probably gonna bounce, right? <laughs> Pretty quickly. So, yeah, f the internet got really bloated in the meantime. That's because we're now we, in the developed world, like in Italy and like in the US and these kind of places, like we have bigger pipes, right? We can send more information down, uh, but not everywhere has the big pipes like we do. So that's something to consider. So we're gonna do a bit of an experiment here. Uh, this is LinkedIn.com. This is one of the websites I used to work on. And I'm going to make you watch LinkedIn load on 2G. Now, no, if I see anyone on their laptop or on their phone, I'm just going to knock it out of your hands, and I'm going to say, look at it. All right, you ready? Ready, go. It is working. You can see it spinning up there. All right, so you can see down here is the time. We're in about 10 seconds, and literally nothing has happened. 17 seconds. It's loading, I promise. 25 seconds, S still nothing. Oh, 30 seconds, we finally get a loading spinner. No phone, I told you, no phone. 40 seconds, still on the loading spinner. 
Okay, so about 45 seconds, we're starting to get some content, but not very much useful content. 51 seconds, we got the header. 54 seconds, we're starting to get some stuff on the feed. Okay, we're now past a minute. You didn't think you were gonna spend your day like this, did you? 1.1 minutes, finally above the fold, we're pretty much rendered. And then it should finish here in just a second. There you go, 1.3 minutes. Now, I wanna say that this LinkedIn is a giant company. I think there's 17,000 employees at LinkedIn, which blows most people's minds. Like, what does LinkedIn do? I don't know, anyway. <laughs> Um, 17,000 employees, and this takes forever to load, right? You, you would think, especially something like LinkedIn, that actually should be very applicable in the, de the developing world. It should be like re very much ready for that kind of audience. It should not take 1.3 minutes to load. How many people think that someone would actually wait for this to load? It's going to be like 2%, I don't know, something really low though. So I want to contrast this with something right now. I'm going to make you watch another website load on 2G. Don't worry, this one's a little bit more exciting. So this is a company called Trevo. Uh, it's a motel chain, or hotel chain, I'm not actually sure. It's a some sort of accommodation chain in India, okay? And we'll be loading on the exact same speed, okay? You ready? So in about two seconds, we got most of the content. At about seven seconds, we got all the pictures and at about 12 seconds, we're done. That's insane, right? That felt like it was on 4G, and that was loaded on 2G speeds right there. Now, let's, let's give the giant caveat here. Um, I, I loaded the one specifically for phones on this, uh, for this website. With the LinkedIn one, I loaded the desktop experience, which you would not go to the desktop experience on 2G speeds, right? And, and LinkedIn does have other ways of accessing the site without using the desktop experience. There is a uh, special Android app that they have for India. But nonetheless, I wanted to, to prove a point. There are plenty of websites just like that. I can just use LinkedIn because I worked there, so I'm also digging it myself all, you know, at the same time. So if this is a competition, Bangalore is definitely kicking Silicon Valley's ass, right? <laughs> like it's not, it's not looking very good for us over here. Um, and I think that's going to, to be honest with you, I think that's a trend that's going to continue. Um, so it's definitely something that you should be considering, especially um, considering whatever products you're working on. If you're working on something like Trebo, you should definitely be considering, yeah, we should work on, you know, slower speeds. Okay, so hopefully you feel bad at this point. That was my entire premise to this point, is getting you to feel bad about yourself and the things that you're doing with your life. So what do you do? This is how I feel most of the time. <laughs> just floating through space, just doggy paddling and going backwards. <laughs> so that's what I felt like when I kind of started, into especially working on some of this LinkedIn stuff, is like this is such a massive website. There's so many problems and they're so hard to fix. Like, what do I even do about this? So I'm going to give you a bunch of, like, tips and tricks here, again, just you know, pick the ones that work for you. Like for example, this one, you probably can't just swap out your framework. That's kind of ridiculous, right? But I also want you to be aware when you go to choose your new framework, what kind of choices you're making just by choosing your framework, right? So uh, these were current as of earlier this week. Uh, just here, th this is the size of just the framework when it's been minified and gzipped. And this is how long that takes on 2G speeds. So, Preact, which is a, a framework near and dear to my heart, I quite like it, uh, especially if it's something I'm going to ship to production. One, the first thing I think about is can I use Preact for this? That's just a personal opinion, but it's, it's something you should probably think about too. By choosing Preact, you are adding 0.1 seconds to your page load. That sounds pretty palatable, right? All right. Moving down, go to Vue, really awesome framework as well. I'm a big uh, Vue fan. Uh, I get to work with one of the core maintainers, Sarah. Uh, so Vue, 0.7 seconds, right? That, that's a lot. 
And that and view's not that big, but just by adding that into your application, you've added 0.7 seconds to your page load. Going down here to React DOM, this one's getting smaller at a time. Uh, it used to be 45, but with React 16, that went down to 32. Uh, and that's adding a whole second. Angular, uh, this is Angular 2. Oh, well, I guess it'd be like Angular 4, I think is back. Well, it is 6 just came out, I know. I know. No, I'm just kidding. You're right. Uh, but I think I measured this with Angular 4. Uh, so that's two seconds. Uh, and the other thing to say about Angular is they have, well, we'll talk about it later, but the thing called Angular Ivy, which is going to greatly improve that for some use cases. And then, oh, sweet Ember. Does anyone in here write Ember at their day job? That's what I thought. Not many people. So that's actually what LinkedIn is using. Um, 144 kilobytes just for the framework. And you can't break it up. It's all just comes in one giant monolith. Now, I don't want to rag on Ember too much. I know some really smart people that work on it and work with it. They're all really awesome. And the stuff that they can do is, is really magical. They can make applications really fast. Like if you've ever seen like a really, really talented Ruby on Rails developer, they just make like, they just like command an app into existence, right? <laughs> it's crazy. As I feel the same thing about Ember. But to load that page, just, just the framework for Ember is almost five seconds of page load, right? Just by choosing Ember, you've basically said, I don't want 2G. That's not important to me, <laughs> right? Pretty much. So next, here's our next tip. Uh, so Babel is a really cool JavaScript transpiler. It's a personal favorite, of, like one of my favorite projects. It's the one I probably contribute to the most. Um, they have these things called presets, which are groups of plugins, right? So basically, if I give a, a, a script full of brand new like JavaScript syntax using all the latest features, it'll take all that and it'll compile that back to ES5, which is old JavaScript, which works on like like 99% of people browsing the internet today, right? So most of us don't even think about it. They just throw in Babel preset tw uh, 2015, which gets you everything in ES6, and then they just go, right? It's just kind of like those one of the things like, this used to work for me before, so I'm just going to copy this from my old project and paste it into my new project and keep going, right? That's why so many people are still using this. So here's the problem with that. The problem with that is um, browsers are getting better, right? And b browser share is getting better and better. So um, most people are, are browsing the internet now with a modern browser. So most people are browsing with a, a browser that supports arrow functions, right? You used to have to transpile arrow functions or you'd have some sort of uh, like fault or something like that. But now most browsers support it. And so if the browser supports it, you don't want to transpile it because it, your app gets bigger and it also gets slower. So instead, th uh, with Babel 7, they now do this thing called preset env. How many of you have used auto prefixer before for CSS? Super convenient stuff, right? You don't ever have to tell us like, tar like stop transpiling this or start transpiling that. You just say like, hey, just make sure this works for most people and then you just forget <laughs> about it, right? That's one of my uh, favorite projects as well is auto prefixer because it's one of those things that I set, uh, I set it up and it just continually makes my project better. It's kind of the same thing with preset env. You say, hey, make sure this works for the last two latest browser revisions, so like Chrome 61 and 60, right? And make sure it works for those things. And then uh, as like Chrome 62 comes out, it'll stop transpiling for 60 and it'll just transpile for 62 and 61. So it'll just continually compile less and less of your code as time moves forward, right? Really, really, really cool stuff. So this is one that you can definitely do today. If you are using this, please just go and change it to preset env. Like just do that today, it's really easy. It'll make your uh, bundle smaller, and yeah, it's, it's just good. So this is kind of an interesting technique. This was developed by one of my f uh, friends at LinkedIn, who's now at Google. Um, there's a thing called script type equals module here. This is a really, really new feature in browsers that you can actually use ES6 imports inside of your scripts and then have the browser do the resolution of modules. It's pretty crazy, right? Uh, mo most modern browsers now support this type equals module thing. Uh, and what's cool about the fact that this is supported by modern browsers is that if a browser 
doesn't know how to read type equals module, it just ignores this line and, and it'll go find another one that it does know how to read. So what you do is you say, hey, type equals module and then compile the fewer transformations.js, right? And it'll go download that one and you just make it so it ignores the other one, right? And so uh, new browsers will get the one that have compiled with fewer transformations and they'll only download it because of this type equals module and then everything else will get this one down here, the compiled with all the transformations, right? And so you can actually cover, t you know, two different user groups just by kind of fiddling with your build a little bit. It's kind of, uh, it can lead to strange bugs uh, I'm not going to say this is free, <laughs> but uh, yeah, be careful with that one. Okay, so tree shaking. This is kind of a, a fun little exercise. So we've all used Lodash before, right? It's the kind of like standard library that JavaScript never had that we kind of wish it did. Uh, so if you just go in here and say, this is all the code that I have right here, and this is 73.3 kilobytes. Uh, that is not gzipped. So uh, 73.3 kilobytes just by requiring lodash and doing underscore dot get. So kind of a non-starter. You don't want to add that much code to your, your bundle just, just for one function, right? Well, enter this really cool thing called tree shaking. So this is env right here. This is what we were talking about before. And I'm going to include env and the thing I'm going to tell, it, oh, this is the last two version things. This is how you tell it's like, hey, yeah, only support the last two versions. But I'm going to tell it modules false, that part right there. So what modules false is going to do is it's going to say, hey, Babel, don't change any of the modules. Let Webpack handle it. And now Webpack actually understands modules natively. It doesn't have to worry about common JS and all that kind of stuff. And it, it can do this really cool thing. It says like, hey, you're calling underscore.get, and that's the only function that you're calling with underscore. I'm just going to include the code for that and not include it, the, the rest of the code. This is called tree shaking. Uh, the other word for it is live code inclusion. That's the, the synonym of it, which is not the same as dead code elimination, just so you know. One, you're including only the things that get called. The other one is that you're trying to eliminate things that are dead, right? Which largely sounds the same, but yeah semantics, I suppose. So now if I change this code to look like this, and I'm importing from this lodash.es, which is just bundled differently, that's the only difference between that and lodash, and then I call get, this works exactly the same with the same functionality, the same underlying code, I went from 73.3 to 11.1. So definitely something to, to investigate if you are using libraries like lodash or moment or some of these that are actually uh, well equipped to handle uh, tree shaking. So I, I just wanted to show you what a graph of that looks like. This is what it looks like, uh, the bundle. So this is a visualization of what the bundle looks like, right? Each one of these squares represents like a file that it's including, right? So my code down is down here, index.js, right? And then all this shit is coming from Lodash, right? I'll, it all goes up there into bundle. That's a lot of code for, for just one thing. But this is what it looks like if you include everything. Like, I can't even read that. That's a pretty big screen. So, yeah, it's cutting out a lot of stuff. So, tree shaking. So, tree shaking is, no, this is a silver bullet, right? I thought it was funny. I still think I'm funny. Anyway, so, it's not a silver bullet. Why? Well, first of all, it's not going to really affect your code very much, right? Hopefully you're not writing a lot of code that never gets called, right? So it doesn't make a lot of sense to try and sh tree shake your own bundle. You should really only be sending code that's getting uh, used anyway. And then it's not going to be very effective on things like React and Ember and some of these other things. Reason being is that I know for a fact with React it doesn't do anything because when you uh, import React, React uses all of its code. You're not getting any dead code when you include React. It works really well with something like Lodash because Lodash is like 200 separate little functions, right? It makes sense that you can, you know, pick things out of there. With React, it's, you just get the React library and that's, that's what it is, right? So before you invest too much time into using tree shaking, make sure that it's actually going to benefit what you're doing. The other thing is that the library actually has to be built with tree shaking in mind. That's why you have to use the lodash-es for that to work. Um, otherwise, 
Um, if you just use the normal low dash package, it won't work because it's not bundled correctly so that tree shaking can happen. Use built-ins. So this is a, a fairly new thing from Babel. So you see up here, this is a, a parameter that you'll give your build, uh, sorry, your Babel configuration. And you, you say use built-ins usage. What this is going to do is it's basically going to detect via what you've set your env to be for, you know, we were talking about before, uh, Babel preset env. And it's going to say, hey, if you don't need, or this is my code right here, a and b, j, s. Let's just look at the promise one. So if I have this var a equals new promise, uh, this is what I'm going to get out if my environment does not support promises. I'm going to get this import core JS modules ES6.promises, right? So it's going to include the polyfill for, for promises, so that'll still work. However, once we move past a point that I don't need that polyfill anymore, it's just going to stop including the polyfill. Now, why is this really cool? One, you're only ever going to get the polyfills that you need. Whereas before, you were always getting all of polyfill.js, which is a pretty decent sized file, right? Now, with you, uh, usage, you only get the individual um, thing that you need, which is pretty cool. And don't worry about that. It, it will, in, uh, in the end, end up in, um, importing like this polyfill multiple times. But with the way that module resolution works with Webpack, that's OK, because it'll still only import one, one copy of it. So that's another one that's pretty much free. I would say just go ahead and see if you can just throw that in today. Um, it really shouldn't break anything. Now so it's gonna, someone's going to go do it. It's going to break something. So <laughs> uh, I would say sorry, not sorry. OK, so loose mode. This is one that's a bit older with Babel. Uh, you don't, don't bother actually trying to read what that code is. This is the polyfill for classes, ES6 classes. Uh, as you might imagine, when you're writing classes, there's a lot of weird interactions with classes with other features of JavaScript. There's a lot of edge cases, right, of like weird things that you can do with classes that only cover like maybe 0.1% of, of reasons people would use classes. In other words, it's not a reason that you would use a class, right? So with this polyfill here on the left, where is my cursor? I can't see it. Oh, there it is. So with this one here on the left, um, this includes all of the weird edge cases that you'll never use. And if you just say, hey, do loose mode, like ignore all of the edge cases and give me just like the 99.9% .9 useful one, you'll get the one here on the right, which is just like the really basic, like I assume that you're going to write sane code version. So. Go check out if loose mode will work for you. I've been using loose mode since they started using it, which was forever ago, and it's literally never bitten me in the butt. So we can, by induction, we can assume that it's not going to bite you in the ass either. So, okay. This one's, this one's you definitely should be doing this. This is a problem if you're not doing it. Uh, when you're doing your build, please build with node env equals production. Um, uh, Slack famously didn't do this, so they were shipping the, the development version of React to you. When you're an Electron app, that's actually not really that big of a deal, except it kind of is, because the debug version of React is actually like t like 100 times slower or something like that, because it has like useful debugging output and all that kind of stuff. So make sure when you're running your build, node env equals production, because a lot of libraries will compile themselves differently in different environments, right? So just Please, please go double check that you're doing it. Code splitting. So the name of the talk is 10 kilobytes or bust, right? Uh, the only way that you're going to get to under 10 kilobytes is by code splitting. Like, there's, l we're writing too complicated of applications to for them not to get over 10 kilobytes pretty quickly, right? Uh, I've been trying to figure out like what's the most complicated thing I can write in under 10 kilobytes. And for me personally, I was able to write a pretty decent like Google Photos clone, and that's about it, the most complicated thing I could do. For example, there's no way you could fit something like uh, Gmail in 10 kilobytes, right? But the thing that you can do is you can fit your initial page load into 10 kilobytes, assuming your framework will play nice with that, right? So the way that you do that is something called code splitting. Do I have anything for that? No, I don't. So code splitting is basically saying, load everything that you need 
just critically for your very, very first page load, and then I'm just going to load everything else later. So you'll land on the home page, and then the user will click like, let, you know, let's go to the login page, and then from there it'll go out and request um, the login page, and then it'll use that code to, you know, run that. So basically you identify points in your application is like, I don't need this right now. I'm going to defer that to being loaded later. Because most of the time, people don't actually need everything that you're sending them you know, every single time, right? So that's how code splitting works. It's really easy to do with Webpack. Um, you just use the import function. Webpack's going to say, like, oh, you're trying to use an import function. I'm going to make this a code split for you. And then you end up with multiple bundles. You can actually even get like a step further than that. You can use service workers. Uh, which basically act like a proxy between you and your server that live locally for you. And what you can do is you, you send your initial bundle, you start up your service worker, you have your service worker go out and request the rest of the bundles, and then you have your application whenever it needs to uh, load the next piece of code. It just asks the service workers, like, hey, have you loaded this chunk for me? And the service worker will just get it for them. So you do all that work in the background, so it's all very seamless to the user. Really cool stuff. It adds some complexity to your application, but it will allow you to load things a lot faster. Source maps. I wish I didn't have to talk, like I wish this, this is one of these things that's so obvious that I wish I didn't have to talk about it, but I'm gonna talk about it because we, someone's in here is probably doing it. Don't include source maps in production. That's it. Like that's the bottom line of this slide, just like don't do it. Seriously, if you include, source maps in your production bundle, it can make it like four times larger. Like you can go from like 50 kilobytes to like 300 or something like that. Um, it, source maps are really useful for debugging, right? It'll tell you like if you're, you know, transpiling from modern JavaScript to, to ES5, it'll actually tell you in the developer tools the, act, the actual modern code that yielded your problem, which is really cool. But it sucks in production because no one cares about your code. So <laughs> don't, don't include source maps. <coughs> Let's talk about scope hoisting. This one's kind of a, uh, it's new to Webpack anyway. It was pioneered by a library called Rollup. Uh, if you're building libraries or SDKs, you should be consider using Rollup. Just as a side note, most of us are not building SDKs or libraries. Um, but that's where Rollup is really useful. But uh, Rollup has this really interesting idea called uh, scope hoisting, and I'll explain it to you here in just a second. The word for it for Webpack is the module concatenation plugin. And actually, I think they're building this into the, the newest version of uh, Webpack, so you don't even have to include this. But if you're using Webpack 3 or 4, I think you have to include this, uh, this plugin. So this is a very, very subtle difference. But here on the left, this is not scope hoisted. So when I have this helper function, assume this is some module that I'm importing to help me, right? It then calls this webpack require method with zero, zero being like some number that represents where helper is in like the webpack heap, right? This webpack require method is not free. So there's a bunch of work that has to go on to like go out and fetch that module. And then it's just expensive to have to keep calling this method over and over and over again throughout your entire code, right? What's actually a lot faster to do is if you can just inline the helper method right there. You just stick the entire thing right there. Because then when I go down here to call helper, it's, it's just available in the scope, right? So you're actually putting this into the scope that this can be then call it in. And surprisingly, this actually yields really huge wins. Um, well, first of all, it gzips really well. That's a big part of, the, of why this uh, helps. So this person, I don't, I don't know who they are. Uh, they went from 70 kilobytes to, to 37 kilobytes using this. And their startup times went up really, really well as well. So pretty cool, right? Now, the reason why they don't make this by default it, I guess there are some edge cases where this doesn't help. Or it can make things worse, or it can just flat break things as well. I think they're trying to resolve it so that it's always doing this scope hoisting for you, uh, but that, that has not happened yet. Image skeletons. So 
Let's talk about image skeletons. One of the biggest parts of your websites are your images, right? Now, be careful not to be comparing kilobytes to kilobytes, right? One kilobyte of image is not equivalent to one kilobyte of JavaScript. Be loading it, one kilobyte of image is pretty easy, because once you load it, it's really easy to just like parse and throw that on the screen. The, the browser is very good at displaying images. When you are loading one kilobyte of JavaScript, it has to be tokenized, parsed, interpreted, and then executed ultimately, right? So it's actually far more expensive. A lot of time is spent just on the execution side, whereas with an image, it essentially has no execution time. But that being said, it's still stuff to download, right? So something that people have suggested, and I think is actually a really awesome idea, uh, is using what are called image skeletons. So here on the right, these images are the full-size images, right? This one and this one. This is the image approximated using 100 elements with SVGs, and this is it using 10. The one in the middle pretty much looks like it, right? It looks really close. So what you do is you include this in line in your HTML or in your CSS, right? And then you defer loading of this later. So you actually you show them something immediately, because that SVG is literally three kilobytes or something like that. It's really, really, really small. Whereas this, you know, say it's a huge image, it could be like two megabytes or, you know, or upwards. And, and you know, this one with just the 10 shapes, it's, I don't know, probably like one or like 500 bits or bytes or something like that. So this is one technique. I think this is the way that Gatsby does it now. If you've ever used Gatsby, the uh, React-based uh, static site generator. This is used, something used, uh, Primitive is the name of it. The library is doing that. This is also another really cool one. So you, it loads like using some process, it just like, lo this is kind of light, but can you see that there's an outline there? So it'll load like a light outline of something and then when the image loads, it just you know loads on top of it. This is another cool way of doing it. There's no library that does this. The person that did this uh, did it by hand to prove a point, but there's no reason that we couldn't figure out a library to, to do something like this. And then this one's kind of my personal favorite. So they use animations with SVGs to kind of like draw the images and then it's loaded in the background. And these SVG or these animations are really easy because everything in here is a path, and you just say go from point A to point B, and it just all kind of animates together. And these uh, uh, these uh, approximation SVGs again are really really small compared to the images. So if you're using a really heavy image site, these are things that you can uh, consider doing. And then there, these are just four more that I wanted to just throw out there for you. Even uh, just throwing a box up there, putting a placeholder, something, the solid color that like you just detect, like what's the most common color in this? Or this is one that Facebook's famous for doing, which is called the blur up, that you take the image, you just blur the hell out of it, make it like really, really small. And then as soon as something loads, it just loads in front of it, right? But the key here, Ultimately, you are loading more data, right? You, you do have to load the placeholder and the, the image, but what you do is you defer the loading of the big image as long as possible, right? Because you're not actually taking away f too much from the UI while you're loading this in the background. That's, that's the general idea. And I think it just underlines the fact that performance is as much technical work as it is psychology, right? You're kind of trying to trick people to think that your website's fast. And this is a good technique in doing it, of like throwing things up on the screen as fast as possible so that the user can start kind of parsing mentally what your website's supposed to do and they can start trying to make decisions, it'll make your website feel fast to them, which is ultimately the same, right? You're just going for that feeling of being fast. So I just threw something together and by using some of these techniques, I was able to cut my initial page load down to like, you know, almost three megabytes out of there, which is pretty cool. So just to kind of summarize a little bit what we've talked about, how much time do I have? Oh, I have a bit of time, cool. So uh, your initial page load, definitely aim to have that under 10 kilobytes. That'll just cover your all of your bases. Um, and uh, 
yeah, it makes your website feel nice and fast. So in, invest time into your build. A lot of people just kind of copy and paste something off Stack Overflow and just say, this build, I'm not going to touch it anymore, and then no one wants to touch it. <laughs> I know you've all done it because I've done it. So invest time into your build. Uh, it is worthwhile to learn Webpack or Parcel or whatever you're using to, for your build. Uh, invest time into learning Babel. It's a very useful tool that if you work with it, will work with you. Uh, load no blocking scripts on your page and only the bare styles to get the above the fold visuals. Uh, that's what that Trebo site does. Everything underneath, like the uh, the top part, it looks like garbage at the page load. But you don't care because no one sees it, right? By the time that someone like notices that their page loads and is like, oh, I want to scroll down, by the time that they get down there, stuff will be loaded. So just make sure that the visuals above you know, what the user can see are rendered. Everything else, just hurry and fix it later. Okay. Using a script to load everything else in the background, you'll probably need some sort of like orchestration script for that. Use image skeletons in the meantime. Uh, yeah, I, the Trebo one uses uh, the blur up technique as well. In fact, if you want to see that, we can just go back really quick. Jeez, we have to go back pretty far, don't we? Oh, nope. First, we got to watch this again. Just kidding. <laughs> so watch the background image. You probably didn't even notice it the first time, right? Because you don't actually really care what's there, right? But like you notice that, like, oh, stuff is there, and then like you're re reading the test, the text somewhere else, right? So that's actually a really, really great uh, exa example of that. And we were here, okay. The other thing I should say about code splitting is be very careful where, where you code split. If you're only code splitting like three kilobytes off of something, it's actually actively not helping you. It's making things worse. It's making your code more complicated and it's not helping your page load really. Like three kilobytes is not going to save you that much. You really should be code splitting at points where you're going to like cut like 50, 100, 200 kilobytes off, right? Stuff like that. So, so be careful with code splitting. It's a... It's, uh, it's a dangerous tool. Okay, so I'm going to give you some tips on, like, some back-end tips now, a little bit, because I have a little bit of time to do so. Um, specifically, a little bit about functions, right? Like, most of you have probably heard of Azure Functions or AWS Lambdas or the the serverless stuff. Uh, I like to call them remote functions because that's really all you are, they are. Like you just write a function and then you throw it in the cloud. That's that's about the the extent of it. I think they're super fun. Um, I threw up this little link right here if you want to play around with them. Microsoft will give you like 200 bucks for free to, to toy around with them. Uh, and so that's aka.ms/jsday. So check that out if that's interesting to you. So you want to reduce your time to first byte. That's ultimately the the key here, um, you want to reduce the time to that from when the user makes a request, hits your server, that you start sending stuff back to them, right? It's one reason that HTTP2 can be really useful. Um, the one I want to talk about is Server Timings API. This will just help you understand where things are getting slow. So here in this red box over here, this is some page that I'm loading. Uh, in the side of this red box right here, you can see um, I've actually gone through and timed everything on the back end, and then I send that down in a header with my request so that in the Chrome DevTools or the Firefox DevTools, I can actually look at it and see, uh, hey, you know, your cache is taking this long, your total CPU time is taking this long. You, know, you can actually see all this stuff like side by side with like all the front end stuff as well. So definitely check out using the server timings API. No, please compress your responses. Uh, I, when I started working at uh, LinkedIn, I found out that the API was not compressing any of the responses, like is, which is just like a huge face pummel. It's literally free performance, right? So everything was being sent down uncompressed, which is just unbelievable. So just this is a, a, an extreme example, but if you can you can compress something from 73.28 kilobytes to 241 bytes. It's a massive difference. 
So just go and look at your like API responses and make sure that it says like, hey, I gzipped this, by the way. They did it for like two years, which is just blows my mind. 17,000 employees, by the way. <laughs> okay, Brotly. So this one's kind of a newer thing. Brotly is a new compression technique. I was just talking about gzip, which is the one that most of us use. Uh, but there's a new one, uh, I believe it's made by Google, uh, called Brotly, which is an even better way of compressing things. The trade-off here when you're choosing Brotly, well, first of all, you have to do both because not everything supports Brotly, uh, but it takes a lot longer to compress, like significantly longer to like run through the compression, whereas gzip's pretty fast. But for me, personally, I, like, I don't care how long it takes my build to run. That's not totally true, but I care less about how long it takes my build to run. So you can see here, in modern markets where people are using modern browsers, uh, that actually can save you quite a bit of time. So lower is better in this graph. Uh, in, even in India, it, uh, you, they saw some decrease in page loads as well. So this is just what, when LinkedIn's turned on broadly. And here's the support for it. So you can see here, you, you don't get any IE support, but you have Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera. All the modern ones now support Broadly, which is pretty cool. Even iOS Safari now. Does. Thank you, Apple. <laughs> uh, cold start. This is actually a huge problem with uh, just serverless in general. They shut down your functions when they're not being used, right? Uh, which is good. It saves you a ton of money. If you have something that's not being called very often, this is, uh, this is hugely useful to you. Uh, the problem is that when they start again, it has to go through all the module resolution again, which takes time, right? So there's actually a thing that Microsoft puts out called Azure Function Pack, which is really just Webpack. <laughs> it's a Webpack that we've wrapped that just runs Webpack on it and prepares it to be used at ser in for serverless. Eventually, we'd like to make this just like a part of it that we just run behind the scenes for you, but uh, there's some reason that we don't. I don't know what it is. Anyway, Azure Function Pack, this will help you with cold start. If you have something that must be like um, hot all the time, what you can actually do is you can set up a, a separate function that calls the other one every once in a while and it prevents it from going into hibernation. Life hack right there, okay. The future. Computers are the future. No, I'm just kidding, that's not useful. <laughs> uh, this is something that I got from Henry. He's the core maintainer of Babel. He said that they want to detect if you're using things that require not loose mode, strict mode, I suppose. Uh, and then they then they would opt in automatically to not using loose mode and, and otherwise ship loose mode for you automatically so you wouldn't have to set that, uh, which is pretty cool. Ahead of time compilation, this is something that Angular does. It basically does some basic like ahead of time, like running your code to like compile it down to something. Uh, but it's pretty basic so far, but it is cool. Partial evaluation, I think this one's going to be uh, really big going forward is for using something called prepack. If you've not heard of prepack, check out prepack.io. It's from Facebook. So here on the left, we have this code right here that does, you know, hello world, two functions, and it says global.s equals hello plus world. And what prepack does is it just goes through and runs your code and it says, yeah, you're just printing out hello world, and so it just cuts out all that shit. <laughs> Which is pretty cool, right? Even this, which is the Fibonacci sequence, right? This is like a recursive thing that's going to like, you know, spiral out into this giant recursive tree. It actually will go through and run this, and it'll just say x equals blah. So, really cool. Uh, as you might imagine, it's a little scary because it's cutting out so much of your code. Uh, so they're really trying to get that right. But I'm told that there are places in Facebook that they're uh, they're con starting to like roll some of this stuff out, which is really cool. Disappearing frameworks. So this is something that a uh, framework called Svelte already does. Uh, Svelte is made by the same person that made Prepack. Uh, and Buble, he's made a bunch of stuff. Rich Harris, really smart, really smart guy. So basically what it does is it um, compiles your code to like just the bare minimum code to run uh, your your application and it removes all the framework code out of it and it does that all on the server side. So you actually don't ship the framework. You just ship like the bare minimum JavaScript to make the components run, which is really cool. Angular has started doing something as well. This is called Ivy. 
they're able to ship a Hello World Angular application in 2. Oh no, 3.2 kilobytes, which is unbelievable and just like melts my mind. Uh, it's it's web component ori oriented, and I'm told that it will not work for every application. It's actually more oriented towards like libraries and things like that. But uh, even still, really cool stuff coming out of out of Angular. And then binary bytecodes. So the one here on the right is Glimmer. This is something that uh, LinkedIn is working on uh, with the Ember team, or the Ember team is working on it, and they're just all happen to work at LinkedIn. Um, so you have this framework, and then the framework actually reads binary bytecodes. So the, the first page load has to load like the entire bytecode interpreter. Like they call it a virtual machine. And then everything that it requests after that is binary, which is crazy, right? Binary in JavaScript. And I'm told that Svelte is considering doing the same thing. In fact, they're working on making Svelte do that as well, so that Svelte can be even smaller than it already is, which is pretty cool. Uh, I wanted to show you a couple more statistics. Um, there's a thing that uh, where you build a Hacker News clone. It's kind of like the new to-do MVC, but they're doing it more oriented towards like having something that you can compare um, performance on. So the fastest one that they've gotten uh, is Preact, and it's able to get 1.92 seconds to load a Hacker News clone using this uh, wicked fast Preact one. Uh, Svelte is the second fastest, uh, and this is sorted based on 2G. For some reason, React DOM is faster on 3G. I haven't quite figured that one out. Uh, but even Angular is getting pretty impressive numbers, like four seconds to load an entire application with Angular, considering that you're starting out with 60 kilobytes just in the framework. is pretty impressive. So um, something to definitely check out when you're considering your next framework. And cool. Uh, I'll stick around for a little bit, but yeah, thank you.